Well, so okay. when when uh, my father died in ninety eight, um, after I kind of got over, I was pregnant at the time also, and had a we knew there was something wrong, but we didn't know what, and so it was a troubled pregnancy. Then he died. Then my daughter was born with multiple handicaps that uh, were life threatening. So life just became a, a meat grinder. But once that had kind of lessened, um, I started missing him terribly. <laughs> and uh, I used to travel with him. I used to talk to him, you know, sometimes every day, so certainly every week. Um, and he was my favorite person to hang out with. So when I started to be able to come up for air, um, I went on the internet, which was fairly new at the time and typed his name into Google and discovered there were discussion lists about his work. And so I started looking at those and saw people arguing about what Rosen meant when he said this, and there would be a quote. And I realized I knew exactly what he meant <laughs> because we had talked about it. And so I started to participate thinking that mostly I would just be able to flesh out, you know, uh, their mental models of the guy. But in the process, I realized just how comprehensive my own understanding of his work had gotten to be um, just from traveling with him, from spending a lot of time with him. And it was, his work was not a job, it was part of him. It was something, it was an extension of his you know, mind. So for me, that made it interesting, even though I was more interested in writing fiction and painting. Um, but just because of all the time that I spent with him and the curiosity, you know, that native, whatever, the habits of thought that I inherited or encoded. I mean, I have them encoded in me about every which way you could have someone. And, uh, and so I started to participate in those discussions more and more. And one of the people in those discussions was John Kinnaman, who uh, was active with the IISS. And he asked if I'd be interested in co-writing a paper with him. So I said, sure, why not? You know, and we co-wrote a paper. And he said, would you be interested in coming to the conference and uh, co-presenting? So I said, sure. <laughs> so I went to the first, my first ever IISS and discovered at that conference that my father had been a past president. <laughs> and that it was a big anniversary that year. And so they asked if I'd do a plenary. And I said, sure. And then I had to go look up what a plenary is. And uh, at that point in time, I was not used to public speaking and it, it made me very nervous. But uh, in the time between then, I became a big, I mean, a meditator, a Vipassana meditator, um, and did a lot more speaking and joined the IISS and, uh, have a lot of good friends there and so now it doesn't even give me butterflies anymore <laughs> so luckily for you guys I don't have that problem but um, in the process of, of trying to describe and pass on what he gave to me because as a non-scientist you know he gave me different examples and he put in his books and what I was finding at the IISS was that the kind of examples that he gave me work better for them than the ones that he put in his books. And in fact, a lot of people, even very technical scientists have trouble reading his work, at least on the first run through. Um, I keep telling people, you don't need to know the mathematics to get the information. I asked him that specifically. And he said he, he wrote it all in prose first and then wrote it again in mathematics for those who wanted to pick an argument. So um, you can skim all of the mathematics and still get all of the concepts from his work. And that helps some people uh, who would otherwise be too intimidated to, to persevere. But um, I do also find that every time I read his books, different things come out. It's almost like a Hogwarts, you know, school of wizardry kind of book because I'll see something that I've missed on the last 10 or however many times I've read these books. And, uh, and I'll be like, how did I miss that before? But it seems like once you integrate 
everything up to the point where you were and beyond. And then you, you see different things. It suddenly makes sense all of a sudden. So anyway, um, his books are worth ref using as reference works. And I do that a lot. So every time I crack them open, I discover something new and it's, it's exciting. And it helps me to further integrate the ideas that he had. So, um, this picture was taken by one of his PhD students, Aloysius Louis, in his office in Halifax. Um, we spent, well, I spent four years in Halifax. He spent 24 years or so um, there. And it's a typical, it's a typical picture of him with his pipe. Uh, and you can't see it, but there are probably burn holes in his shirt from pipe tobacco that got away from him. And um, to this day on Father's Day and his birthday, I, I use my incense burner and burn some of his pipe tobacco because it just brings his presence right, you know, it conjures. <laughs> but anyway, so go to the first slide, please. And um, this is his modeling relation. And he used this a lot. I've seen a lot of people using it. Some, use, some give attribution, some don't. If you see a diagram like this, even if the names on the sides are changed, it's my father's uh, diagram. And he said, this relation is kind of the description of science. It's the description of anticipation and it is the description of the modeling relation. And if you can skip to the next slide. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. So he, he, says that 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 and I have that um, same diagram it comes up twice more in these slides because it is so important but he this one, this one yeah it'll come back up so don't worry about it uh, but you he, need to tell us what is N and F stands for N is the natural system and arrow number one is the causal entailment that makes it what it is arrow number two is the process of of encoding a model. So it's all of our observations of N and then our creative process of arrow number three, encoding inferential entailment into our model uh, that represents the aspects of the system of interest that we want to be able to predict. And then the fourth arrow is decoding, which is checking the predictions of our model against what the natural system is doing. So F is time. form or formal or F stands for? Formal system, yes. Formal, oh, okay. Yes. So you want to go uh, to the next one? Yeah, next one. Does anyone have a question about that uh, uh, chart? Because that little chart is key to understanding what... It, uh, it will come up twice more, you'll see. It, further down I, in my slide, it comes I back up. I have a question. Could you could you just repeat the the four arrows? So okay, causal right. entailment, inferential entailment, and then the two others I I miss. Okay, so the natural system is N. That's the system that you want to understand. The arrow number one, that circular arrow, is the causal entailment that makes N what it is. Comment, okay. comment from Bernard, if I may. Um, diagrams very similar to that, with basically the same isomorphic interpretation, uh, exists uh -huh. all over cybernetics and science. It's right. the modern relation. So, yes, and and it, it was developed by my father. No, it to, so it's based generally in social, in philosophy of science. So the right side is the modeling part, and the left side is the natural part. And there has to be an encoding and decoding mechanism between the two. Right, exactly. So making the model, which we build, hopefully that the inferential entailment, arrow number three, is enough like arrow number one that we can then predict accurately what will happen with the natural system. And only by checking your model's predictions with the behavior of the natural system will you know if you've done it right and if you've got it accurately and comprehensively enough. So 
Go to the next, the next slide. We'll get back to it. Don't worry. Hi, Peter. Hi, hi Judith. <laughs> it comes from um, uh, Hertz, Heinrich Hertz, uh, and uh, what's called the Hertzian commutation diagram, uh, where if you go back to the to, to Rosen's, um, uh, if you have a, a measurement, uh, and that the result of the measurement is fed into a formal model, then uh, the formal model makes a prediction about the outcome of a second measurement. And if the second measurement and the prediction match, then the image of the consequent is the same as the consequent of the image. Uh, so you have congruence between the prediction of the formal model and the and the uh, and the and the what and, and what the natural and system did. So so one are physical processes or physical laws that are out there. Uh, so n causes itself. Uh, the the physical world just goes along, and and three is the is the predictive model. But it does not have to match. It, it only has to match what's going on in the real world. Uh, that we're interested in. In terms of the outcome. Right. The, uh, it doesn't have to match the process. It's not a sim simulation of the process. Right. Exactly. Um, so it's yeah. about the impalement, not the, the appearance. But anyway, go ahead. Now that we'll, we'll. I'll let you go on. Sorry. Yeah. So, uh, Jamie, this is precisely similar to Karl Popper's model. Yes, and I'm keeping my, I'm biting on my tongue. Okay, well, keep, keep uh, it until we get further along because I think a lot yeah. of these questions will get answered. <laughs> so, my point my though is, is that um, entailment seems to be a, a concept that some folks, at least in the IWS, have trouble with. Because they say, what's the difference between causality and what is what is entailment? And I, so the way I have described it is that entailment is what could happen, and causality is what did happen. So many things can happen that don't, for whatever context. Yeah, okay, it's fine. So I mean, usually, the entailment is usually what we're really looking for, and yeah. uh, and. <laughs> So Other go people. to the next, the next okay. slide. Okay, we stop, interrupt could we stop? Could we stop? Could we stop? Could we stop interrupting her? Please let her <laughs> proceed. <laughs> okay, so the modeling relation in natural law, um, my father described that relation as a natural law. It's an example of a law of nature. So what I have tried to help uh, people get sort of their heads around is that the only reason we can build models of systems which can then accurately and reliably predict future behaviors of the system represented by the models is because the universe carries the entailment for this. And that, that is what he meant when he said it is a law of nature. It's something that the universe does and we make use of. And he further went on, okay, you can go to the next one. Uh, where is it? So entailment are the options, the, aren't they? Yeah, so. Um, this then is the relation that defines what is a model and what isn't, or what is a good model and what isn't. Um, if it's not in this relation, it will not be able, you'll still be able to generate predictions, fine. But they will not accurately tell you what the system is doing or will do. And that is a big issue. Um, there's a whole lot of danger in ignoring arrow number four. And I see many, many science uh, papers that, you know, try to tell you what intelligence is or what uh, learning is or what happens in the brain when we're thinking and so on and so forth. And they're using computer simulations often to, as a sort of model saying that this is what, how the mind works. Well, I question that and I, you know, or I see them ignoring where the model is wrong and then just using where it's right as if the fact that it was wrong 
is somehow not important as long as you're not dealing with those areas where it was wrong. I think these are, are issues that certainly science needs to contend with. But anyway. Um, so it's the testing, ahead. isn't it? It's the yes. testing. Right. It's checking your, your predictions against what the system is doing. Yeah. Go ahead and skip to the next one. So one of the things that people um, have a little trouble with is, is grappling with the idea that living organisms have incorporated this relation into our own organization as a system somehow, just as much as we've incorporated carbon and water and salts and, you know, uh, electricity and so on and so on. Um, we've incorporated this relation in an active functional way into our organization. It's bedrock into what a living organism is and therefore it, it ends up being uh, a way to identify life uh, in, in a, any kind of material system. So one area that, that most people are able to kind of see that it's there is when you talk about mental models. And I, my point is that wherever there's a prediction, there's a model at work. You can't have a prediction without a model um, or without being a model-based system. And this particular photo where there's a cat, you know, crossing the sidewalk and the guy is tying a shoe with a leash in his teeth and his dog has seen the cat and it's a very powerful dog. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where you just glance at it and you know immediately he's liable, he's liable to be in trouble. Uh, you can sort of just see there's going to be trouble there. And so that kind of gets it across that even without thinking about it, without planning for it, you can go, uh oh. So skip to, the, skip to the next one and you'll see I have this, it's the modeling relation uh, slide again. There you go. So this diagram um, has many, many little bits of information in it that aren't explicit. Uh, one of them is that from within the system, with, within arrow number one, the natural system, nothing about modeling it is specified at all. That's all outside of it. And it doesn't tell us how to do that. It doesn't tell you how to do in arrow number two and coding a model. It doesn't tell you whether your model's any good. And it, the model can spit out predictions, but until you compare those predictions with the natural system, you won't know that you've, whether you've done it or not. So all of that is, is kind of worthwhile. I think there should be a whole uh, science of modeling. If there isn't now, there doesn't seem to be. I have not heard of any. Um, and it Old definitely, <laughs> maybe, but it ought to be a science. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's it's called cybernetics. <laughs> yeah. It's called system cybernetics. Theory. Yeah. It should be it's called science. system theory. Clear. You know, okay, go ahead. Okay. So theory. go to the next the next slide. And uh, so the question of of how models are at work in the world around us, um, trying to get people to recognize that we have them both somatically and we have them mentally. Um, every single living organism has them and you can see anticipatory behavior at all levels of biological organization. And, and this was the thing that surprised my father. He didn't really come up to this recognition until he was at Robert Hutchins Center for the Study of Democratic Institutions and he was being asked to put his biology chops, uh, as the saying goes, down on um, problems, social problems, um, economic problems, environmental problems, all kinds of problems that he had never really thought about using his knowledge to try and help answer these questions and find solutions. 
and the whole idea of planning and all of these things that we do that involve the future and the present and pull the future into the present. And he started to realize that just about everything about a living organism is doing that all the time. It's the, the cells of a human body are doing it. Uh, single celled organisms are doing it. And it's, it's kind of, once you see it, it's astonishing to realize that it never made itself known to you before. Um, he started to develop the idea of anticipatory systems theory then, and it, you know, when he got the job uh, in Halifax at Dalhousie, that gave him the time and the funding to really devote to fleshing this out and to testing all of his hypotheses and so forth. Um, so, as he describes in his book, Anticipatory Systems, all living organisms represent a natural self-organized anticipatory system and the behavior patterns manifested by these systems uh, are, it's a common pattern through all life. It's something that should, he predicted, would be true on other planets with, with life that looks very different from what we're used to here on Earth. But it, is, it amounts to the signature of life. And extrapolating from that, um, I have said that I think the reason we have mental models, which everybody seems to have a much easier time uh, agreeing is true because they can see it in their own mind. Um, the only reason we have intelligence is because life is already anticipatory. It's already a model-based, model-guided system. So it follows that intelligence is a concentration of this modeling capacity that we can recognize error and re-encode new models in in real time, in our own lifetime. And the more you're able to do that, the more options you have in a changing, a rapidly changing environment. Um, I was talking with Lowell about uh, some of the dangers of being a model-based system. I didn't really build this presentation on that, but certainly the extinction cascade idea is due to this, it's, and we can talk about it in the, in the hour after this one. But uh, just getting your head around the idea that we've somehow incorporated this modeling relation, this, this capacity for using models to predict uh, behaviors and having models of our environment and ourself as part of our own organization as a living organism and using those models to navigate um, that's kind of what I'm trying to, to achieve here. So go ahead and, and go to the next slide. So if we accept that all living organisms are anticipatory, what does that mean? What, do, what must they have in order for us to exist as we do? Um, and my contention is that we each have a system-based value for self. These are the bedrock models that, we've, that we come into being with. Uh, a system-based based value for health, for self and for health of self. And it's interesting that it's based on the self model. So the organisms that change their self model to offspring when they reproduce, they no longer try to protect health of an individual self. They, either die immediately or they try to protect the health of offspring. And it's kind of a fascinating um, switch that you start to see in yourself as a parent too, that would you die for your child? Well, yeah. Would you die for your neighbor? Um, it, probably not. Um, so those two things are really very important and you can't define health without the self value. It, you can, define it for species, sort of, but each person has their own uh, normal. And 
they may be similar across species, but sometimes they're kind of radically different. It's interesting to see all the differences in human body. Uh, for example, there's different numbers of vertebrae, for example, and so on. Um, so I find it fascinating to, to consider how the self and the health of self values uh, play into all kinds of things like um, cancers where uh, one of your body cells develops its own individual self model and is no longer part of a collective self. And then the rest of the body is just environment. Um, it becomes stuff, a lot of stuff starts to make sense with that. And then because you have those two values, you also then have an optimality scale, which is what is better or worse for health of self. And all sensory information that you gather is evaluated according to this optimality scale. And uh, it's used for steering system behavior within its environment. So those kinds of foundational models are useful. Okay, the next, the next slide. So when we talk about information, and cybernetics talks about this quite a lot. Um, my father said Shannon's information theory is very, very limited. He was only looking at, um, it sounded like technology to me, noise through some sort of uh, transmission medium. But Shannon says it himself. Shannon says it himself. <laughs> Uh, well, information, according to my father, is anything that can be the answer to a question. And some people find that frustratingly vague, but I think if you unpack it, you see that it isn't. And it, what it presumes is that you, you have the models for interpreting. You have the functional requirements for needing to gather information. Um, and only a living organism fits that description. So my, uh, well, optimality, yes, can be involved in science too, but science is a human pursuit. So it's, it's an extension of, the, of our habits of thought, really. But anyway, um, so meaning, my contention is that meaning can only exist within an anticipatory framework, whether we realize we're being anticipatory or not. Uh, it needs ways of being interpreted and, and uh, being related to something, by something. So a prediction can only be useful in a functional relation that you have with your environment or with yourself as a living organism. I mean, it's, it's something you're going to use, whether something is safer if you do this, or if it's more dangerous if you do this, or if there is some repeating cycle that is an opportunity, like a salmon run, um, or whatever. You know, these are all aspects of environment that we then uh, encode into models and then use those models to, to go about our lives. So sensory capacity, and you can skip to the next slide, to me is the, is the proof, you know, that life is all about answering questions, it's about having generating questions and answering questions. It's about having functional needs that we need to serve and then getting the information that is required in order for us to, to serve them. And go ahead, uh, the next slide. This is basically talking about somatic anticipation, which can be very, um, very intricate, very complex, very amazing. Uh, one of the ones that I like to use, one of the examples is, is monarch butterflies, because not only does the monarch butterfly just lay its eggs on the right plant, that's the sum total of maternal uh, help that a mother butterfly gives to its offspring, Lay, lays its egg on the correct plant. But that egg then, <clears throat> for four generations, 
migrates north, and the fourth one turns around and flies back to Mexico. All the others die off over the course of a season, but that fourth one, something triggers a new model in it, and it flies down to Mexico, and all the ones on the eastern side of the Rockies go to the same basic place in Mexico, and if you've seen pictures of that, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, I've been to the place in California, because it's right near Asilomar, where the ones on the other side of the Rockies go, but it's how much information is involved there that's driving that behavior pattern. And you can't really understand that behavior pattern without taking the, the anticipatory nature of life into account. It's just astonishing to me. Okay, go ahead, next slide. Um, another sort of proof of model, model action or active use of models is, is error the error signal, which is rampant in life, uh, both body and mind, and we use it all the time. You can induce an error state in a living thing quite easily. We discovered at some point that we could get Easter lilies to bloom all at a certain time by mimicking the season prior to bloom in their native environment. If we mimic those conditions, we can provoke them all into going into bloom, same with poinsettias. Um, and so these are just other further examples of, of using models to guide behavior, but also not, their, not just their own behavior, but somehow to provoke behavior in the environment that is beneficial or uh, safe for them. So the, the bee orchids are another fun one because they are able to not only look like a female bee of a certain species, but they send out pheromones from that, that are similar to that female bee. And the males try to mate with these flowers and end up transferring pollen from flower to flower that way. And, uh, you know, this is all done without a mind. This is not a, a, a thought process involved. It's completely outside of that level of modeling. So it's just a fascinating set of interactions. And the fact that it's the models of these organisms that are interacting, not just the organism themselves, is a salient point there. Okay, go ahead to the next one. So we have plenty of examples of somatic anticipation in our own bodies that we have no conscious awareness of. And it's sometimes useful to get people to recognize that fact. Um, one is the, the blind spots in our human, the human visual field. You, if you've ever done that uh, little test to find out where they are and how big they are, it's a, it's a simple thing. You can find it on Google and you put two dots on a piece of paper and you move, you look at one dot, but you kind of keep your awareness of the other dot and you move this piece of paper around until that dot winks out. And that's the blind spot. Your, your brain is basically saying that's not a spot, that's just paper. And you have one on each side and depending how big you make these spots, you can see how big your blind spot is. And it's, it's a kind of surprising to realize that our, our brain has been doing that all our life and until you find you know until you catch it in the act you don't know that it's been lying to you all this time and it's really fast if you've ever gone out of a a dark movie theater into the blinding sunlight and you, you don't have a dark spot there before it slowly get you know gets used to the light it's immediate and uh i find that you know, the fact that that exists, that that brain capacity exists in us is astonishing. Okay, so the immune system is another great example because it learns. It learns and encodes memory of pathogens that it's vanquished. And then we have discovered that with vaccines, we can teach it have it make new models of different pathogens, and then it's much better able to, to combat them if, if 
they invade. So with the pandemic right now, this is very much, you know, on everybody's mind. Okay, go ahead to the next one. But the, the aspect of humanity that's uh, a little bit different is that we have such a high level of mental modeling capacity. I think that we are really a dual anticipatory system. And I think the proof of this is that the mind has its own self model and its own health of self model and its own optimality scale. And they may not be the same as the bodies. Um, I have a transgendered sister. And once I got up the learning curve of what that meant, I realized that it's having a mental self model that's different from your bodies in terms of gender. And it's so persistent that the mind really does take precedence. There's no way to just ignore that or pretend it isn't what it is. You can't change it. It is your identity, your gender identity, and they are willing to risk losing everything to make their bodies in line with their minds because they cannot, they try, usually, you know, up until the internet uh, allowed them to network a bit better. They generally tried until they were in their 40s to make that stop, to just get used to being the gender their body said they were. And it is not possible. And uh, there's a lot of very high suicide uh, statistics for transgender people because of that. We are really, what makes us human is, is the identity in our minds. And so uh, it's not something you can just use the will to change. And anyway, um, I have come up with uh, this as an explanation for an awful lot of what I call anticipatory dysfunction. Um, you know, the idea that, that the mind has its, its set of values and the body has its set of values and they're always interacting. So go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. And there's also error. You know, there's both error, mental error, there's uh, error in the immune system where it recognizes body cells as foreign and starts attacking. Or it doesn't recognize a pathogen as foreign and that pathogen then can take over. Um, all of these, you know, or it reacts to a pollen as if it's a terrible um, invading pathogen. And my, my little brother is allergic to peanuts and... Uh, they're like kryptonite, you know, if he gets any peanuts, if he doesn't have an EpiPen, it can kill him. And that's an error in the immune system. And it's a recognition error, just like this one. So go ahead, uh, skip to the next slide. So among the body-mind uh, interactions that can cause dysfunction or can cause effects when they, they work in strange ways. Um, I have never had an anxiety attack, but I know lots of people who have in the description. It's just um, unbelievable. Uh, placebo effect, everybody, I mean, that the placebo effect is so widespread that they have to account for it in medical studies. Um, Post-traumatic stress disorder is one I know something about. Um, but all of these things have to do with body mind interactions and it's this um, warring grinding of, of well, I would say gears except that's a mechanistic <laughs> example but it's a it's a, a non-agreeing shall we say um, self and health of self and optimality scales that we see manifesting okay go ahead to to the next one so sometimes with, with our optimality scale, uh, you can't really predict what exactly is going to happen. But you can predict a ballpark figure. You can kind of get, you know, you can see whether it's likely to be on the negative or the positive. In this case, that guy looks like he's going to be very lucky if that Buffalo doesn't charge them. Um, 
And what some people consider to be risky, other people don't. And so you see people doing things, certainly in the pandemic we've seen this, where your mental models of what is dangerous are radically different from somebody else's, but their behavior endangers you. And what do you do about this? Uh, these are all kind of issues we have to grapple with because with the pandemic, they're all starting to really make themselves known. And I don't have the answers, but I do know that we have to somehow get them to change their models. Um, it's about their mental models. And that is, this is kind of the crucial issue. Okay, go ahead. The next, the next slide. This speaks to the context, uh, the power of context the context-based nature of information. What one organism considers information, another organism may just consider background noise. Maybe it doesn't have the sensory capacity to even detect that. Um, there's a lot that humanity, you know, wavelengths of light that our eyes can't see, but then we develop technologies to pick them up and then we can go, oh, that's, that's what a bumblebee sees when it lands on this kind of flower. And it's, it's really interesting to enlarge our perspective that way. But uh, we are among the lucky ones being able to develop that capacity, that expansion of our sensory capacity. We we'll often see people say, whatever you do, always give 100%, and they don't consider all the flaws in that advice. And um, I guess it's a habit of thought I either inherited or learned from my father, but my brain always immediately looks for the counter example, always. <laughs> so this meme just really appealed to me. And the fact that uh, reductionistic scientific paradigm defines objectivity with context independence, um, as if we're trying to get our heads inside the machine is a mistake. Uh, and this is a proof of that. Go ahead to the next. We're very close to the end here. So here we are, human beings, and we have all these mental models and we have somatic models and they're interacting. And habit patterns um, can become autopilots. Uh, PTSD is a perfect example of this where you, the way you react to something ends up becoming encoded as a limbic level reflex you know the startle reflex of PTSD is something you can't control with the conscious mind and you can't get rid of it with the conscious mind either and I know this from my own experience but um, autopilots are, are a fascinating thing one way to discover your own is to move a clock in your house that you're used to being in a certain place and then see how many times you look at that spot where it was even though you're the one who moved it. Um, I, I find it almost laughable. It gets to that point where you laugh because you looked at it, you know that it, that's the 20 millionth time you looked at that spot, and 30 seconds later you glance over there again to see what time it is. It's just, um, you know, something we, we don't have a choice about. We have to contend with these things because we are anticipatory systems. And we, you know, a lot of people do feel that they are a prisoner of their own behavior patterns that they have reinforced over a lifetime. I go to the next slide. I um, I discovered Vipassana meditation because I was desperate uh, with the PTSD. I had gone through therapy. I had tried everything Western medicine has to offer. I tried a lot of what Eastern medicine has to offer. Nothing could touch that startle. And it was happening at least once an hour during waking time. You know, something, the phone would ring and I'd jump out of my skin like that cat in the uh, uh, Warner Brothers cartoons that would jump and get embed its, you know, claws in the ceiling and be shaking. Um, big adrenaline startle for nothing, over nothing. And my, my first 10-day course of Vipassana meditation, I got home and realized when the phone rang, I didn't jump out of my skin. I just heard the phone ring. And I realized, oh, my God, <laughs> reset that model. 
Olympic level model. When I realized it had that kind of reach, I decided to keep up with it. And I've ever since then, that was 2008. Um, I've been trying to study how the hell it's able to do what it does. Um, but it also keeps you from falling apart in the middle of a pandemic too. Um, so I put the, the web address there if anybody is interested. And if you want to talk about that more, feel free to get in touch. Um, I have no qualms about discussing anything about it. So um, I just leave that for people to do independently. And that is the end. Um, so our format here is uh, both I and Jerry Chandler will give some comment and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. Okay. All right. From my standpoint, I see you and your dad's work as a real stepping stone beyond most philosophies of science, including Popper. And I'm sure I'll get feedback on that one. Uh, be, be, because the, your comment about scientific objectivity being context-free, what I read in Rosen's work is that the loops, particularly that fourth loop back to the world, is an object of scientific study. If we're going to have a science of the image, a science of the models that you talked about, Judith, we're going to have to have some way of seeing how the boundary, how we define the conditions and operation of our symbolically induced models mm -hmm. operate or don't operate. So looking at the focus of our Club of Remy, we've been looking at the limitations of science. Uh, with its symbolic mathematics, etc., that does oh, not. Capture... You have two. Sorry, you have two slides to share with us. Uh, I, I may, I may have that, but but that that, that that's for uh, um, Jerry Jerry's work uh, comment. Okay. So my focus really is on that the boundary, the model, the operation of the model is a object of scientific study. What Kenneth Boulding talked about in terms of the science of the image, mm -hmm. I think we, we can actually base some of uh, its science on what we heard today, but we need to take it much further uh, there. But it's really, from my standpoint, cybernetics is a science of context and how that context under, is understood by us seeking answers in the environment, which means we have to formulate a question with all its blind spots, et cetera, and interact with our creations of changing that environment. It is a dual anticipatory system that must be understood. So J Jerry Chandler, if you could uh, come up with any uh, comments, you're online, I think. May I ask a question from before? Sure. Uh, if you say dual, what is duality? Dual? Um, you mean with a human being being the dual? No, no, I'm, I'm talking to uh, Lobo, Lobby. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I, 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 I would he was using the word dual. What's, uh, it, what it are the is, two? Yeah. Uh, there is a duality. Uh, Heinz von Forster always talked about the cybernetics of cybernetics, the mathematics of mathematics. Yeah, but that's all words. What, yeah, what do you but, mean with that dual? That is a, a, a reflexive system that goes back to the model. I would like to take it farther than that. The dual anticipatory system means I interact with my environment, number one, Number two, I change my environment and I then interact with that change, but I don't know, like our blind spots, the fact that it's there. So that mm -hmm. creates a, a system of positive feedback loops that are detrimental or lethal variables in, in, the, in the modeling system. In Daniel Dubois' words, there are weak and strong anticipatory systems. 
And the weak anticipatory systems entertain models of future states, while the strong anticipatory systems create models of future states. That's beautiful. I like that. So, so that's what I'm trying to get to. Uh, Judith, you may have some additional approaches to that. Well, I, I think living organisms are both. Um, I don't, well, agree with that. I don't, but that's another discussion. Yes. But I think uh, we create, say, for example, with, with uh, algorithms learning, um, you know, the current state of AI would maybe be uh, what I would call a weak anticipatory system. It's kind of um, a mimicry of, of human intelligence capacities that we build into these uh, systems that have some of our ability, but not from their own organization. We're just, we're transplanting behaviors of our own mind into these systems. And they're able then to, to do certain things on their own that we set them up to do and it's useful. Um, but I would call that a weak, maybe a weak anticipatory system if it is. I would claim, but that's perhaps not to be discussed now, uh, yeah. that a strong anticipatory system is only possible if you have a scientific discourse. Lloyd, how would you make connection between Rosen's anticipatory concept uh, with your uh, concept of uh, horizons of uh, meaning? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I've been deeply influenced by Rosen. Yeah, I found it a fantastic book, but he misses that point. He is a biologist eventually. Who? Rosen. Uh. Yeah. Yeah. It's Why? all uh, external world which he wants to model. He doesn't no, not just um, because biological systems model themselves also. You know, yeah. um, it's how you detect when something is wrong and needs repair or whatever. That's a kind of meta biology. It's what? Meta biology. It's a biology of the biology. A meta meta biology. Oh. Okay. No, it's 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 the, it the biology. Yeah, it's the foundations of everything. I mean, we couldn't be doing science if we weren't anticipatory systems. You know, science is a, a human construct. It's something that we do. And so it is anticipatory because we are. That's oh, what I, I would I would not agree. I would okay. say the human con is it's not a human construct, but it is a discursive construct. Okay. It's between us. It's not us who do it. We have our mental models. That's that's as far as we can come, and that's mm -hmm. a weakly so, anticipatory system. Okay. So 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 do animals? Yes. Animals this is a, a completely different. Um, your use of those terms then is different from my father's. It's it's you're talking about a different realm of of phenomena, and what building my on your father's work. Building on your father's work. Okay, well, so he was, he was talking about um, what makes a living organism alive? What is life? Why are living organisms different? What is causing this difference? What is, how can we characterize this difference? And um, how can we model it such that the patterns we model hold across all living species and don't rely on any of the details because as we've seen with the fossil record, our planet has had many, 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 uh, you know, die offs and then come back with completely different things and they're all alive. Everything was alive. So um, it doesn't really matter what they're made of or what form they take. It's, the organization of these systems and the behaviors that are driven by that organization and the form they take is just the mode for how they do those things. But uh, he wanted to stick to the commonalities and come yeah. up with a, a, a relational model of life, which, which is what he ended up doing. I think that's the great contribution of Niklas Luhmann 
that communication is not alive. What is not alive? Communication is not alive. Yet it is no, self organizing. It is a behavior of life. Yes, you can see it that way. Or you can mm -hmm. see it. Then you talk about languaging, yeah, as mm -hmm. behavior. Mm -hmm. You can also mm -hmm. take language. Right. Which is the content of the communication. And that's not that's a lie. It's interesting that, that cells have their own sensory in a human body. Individual cells have their own sensory capacities and, and are able to um, change their behavior based on what they sense. And it's, uh, you know, from apoptosis to, to various me metabolic and immune uh, functions, it's, it's fascinating to realize that our individual cells are communicating with each other and we're not aware of it at all. You know, unless we get a pain somewhere or we get something that, you know, alerts the whole system. It's, it's something we're not even, we're not directing it. We're not aware of it. I find if that. I, if, if I could just uh, interject, I think the main point here is there is not a good science of organization. Yes. Actually, there is. <laughs> Sorry. That, that there is not a good science of organization that understands how to deal with the unique human symbolic systems we create. Uh, and, and there's the I, challenge uh, for cybernetics. Lowell, can I interrupt? Because as soon as true, there is an organization science that has been there for 30 years. And then there is another thing called strategic management science has been there also like for like 60 years. I mean, that they are trying to see how do organizations plan for the future, actually. But that's human organizations, right? But, but, but human even more than human organizations, it's looking yeah. at the discrete organization versus the organization in the environment. Shareholder yeah, value may, has been may, present for 40 years. But, uh, it, Mm -hmm. Yes, um, in the management community, they, there has been again for the last 25 years a, a group that, that look at the environment and, and I am actually, I would love to introduce your work to them uh, because I'm not sure how much they looked at the Rob mm -hmm. role. Uh, but I just want to point out that the, the organization science people are kind of desperate looking for models mm -hmm. that help us understand ah. what's going on uh, because they want to be helpful. <laughs> well, my father um, uh, finally came to realize that system organization is the approach that is the opposite of reductionism. It's what we need to develop in order to understand system capacities and and behaviors and properties. He said that it's obvious, you know, the reductionist approach does not serve when you're talking about a complex system, because when you take it apart to study it, the, the mm -hmm. material components behave very differently in isolation than they do when they're in the intact system that they came from. And you can't get those relations back from studying the material components in isolation. Mm -hmm. So he, he realized very quickly that, that there's something else at work here that we're missing with that approach. And he had hoped that the systems approach would, would develop it. Uh, I have not really seen very much of that yet, um, where people study organization such that it includes relations, it includes interactions, it includes the, the effects of interactions, it includes all of those things that are not material parts of time in various forms. Because uh, as Lola and I were talking about body heat in a human being, it's a, it's a critical component of human physiology within a very narrow like a 10 degree range, you die 10 degrees up or 10 degrees down if your body gets um, beyond that. And yet it's not considered a component because it is considered a, a, you know, incidental kind of side effect. 
but it's not a side effect. <laughs> it's if, a, if I could go to Jerry Chandler, because he was going to be giving some comments, and then we can, because we're getting... Okay. Jerry? Yes, can sir. we stop the share slide and so I can bring up something on for Jerry? Yes, could you bring up my, can you hear me? Yep. I can hear okay. you. Yeah, okay, great. Uh, could you get the slide up, uh, Lowell? Well, I'm uh, looking for Rosen slides here. Let's see what we got. Okay. Yep. Well, yep. well, you're looking, uh, I'll talk a little bit. Uh, so, uh, or, uh, we all from uh, central Minnesota and the banks of the Mississippi, yeah. where we have a beautiful, beautiful winter day, uh, yeah. just and refreshing. Uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, Judith, uh, I would say that uh, I recall fondly meeting you uh, some years back uh, in uh, um, Amiens, France. Uh, oh. I, I knew I must have too. Uh, that was my father's last scientific trip. Oh, really? Uh, yep. I, I met your father several years before that in uh, Annapolis, uh, mm -hmm. and we had a long discussion, a several hour discussion, actually, of uh, uh, his uh, understanding and relationships and uh, beliefs and doubts about the science of uh, chemistry and biochemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think he accepted many of my ideas, but it was a vigorous discussion. Uh, so from that, I would go and, uh, did the slide get up? Yes, the slides are up. Okay, so uh, the uh, second slide gets really to what I would like to ask about, and that is the uh, relationship between the natural uh, system and the formal system. Mm -hmm. That's the next slide. Can you please put it up? Oh, that, that's, can you see that or do I? I see uh, two questions. One is, yeah, what is It's just the two questions. That's, that, that's, that is the slide, two questions. Yep. Okay. two questions. Okay. So, so the, this comes back to the difference. It makes a difference uh, mm -hmm. in regard to the encoding and decoding between the natural system and the formal system. Okay. Uh, the, na the nature of this encoding and decoding uh, is probably pretty fundamental to science. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Okay. And the, so the question then is, uh, what is, is there any difference at all between the encoding process and the decoding process? Oh, yes. A big difference. They're uh, both mental processes, right? Well, the not just mental, because it involves a lot of observation, um, and, you know, an interpretation of what you observe. It involves, you know, taking in information and then um, basically metabolizing it which is what I think the brain does. Um, you know, it's a, it's a information sifter and metabolizer, and it then can... I, I, I've been a practicing chemist for more than 50 years, Judith. I understand that part about uh, it. Yeah, and, and it's also then able to create. So it's, it's a process of creating mental models that we then use to build some sort of... Um, yeah, but the, but the, the term used is a formal model Great. a formal model which is a scientific is there, a is there a difference between a formal model and creating a model there is no difference between a formal model in science and a mental model no those are both the a mental model is, is a mental model personal or is it public it can be either is it, it necessarily public to be science Pardon? Is it necessarily public to be science? Yes. No. Well, it it yes. you know if you don't if you don't uh, share it, then you're kind of um, limiting other people's ability to you know. My father actually talked about that. He did not want to spend time out of his life writing down what he discovered because he would rather be discovering new things. And Rashevsky said to him, can you wish it that everybody would do as you are proposing to do? It's the whole Kantian uh, categorical imperative test. Can you wish that everybody 
chose not to write it down. I mean, have you benefited from the people who took the time to, to write down and report what they found? And he, he had to sheepishly admit that he could not do what he wanted. He had to take that time and write it down because it was otherwise he was a hypocrite and he couldn't stand a hypocrite. So um, if you share it, it's sort of like if, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and you're not there to hear it kind of thing. But uh, if you create a mental model of something, but nobody knows you have it, it's still yours. It's still a mental model. And if you are yes. checking it against, I mean, the difference between mm -hmm. science and anything else like religious belief or science fiction mm -hmm. is checking it against nature. What is that system actually doing and do your predictions match? If you don't care whether they match, then it's not science. And this is the difference between intelligent design arguments because they have a model, uh, a belief model, a belief-based model that they are looking then for things that look like they support, you know, uh, but they ignore everything that contradicts. Yeah, and Judith, I, un I, understand, I understand that line of argument quite well. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so but I, do, I think it wanders rather far from the notion of a formal model and how, what is the relationship between encoding and decoding. These, uh, it, it seems okay. to me that a code, if I can say a scientific code, if you would, okay. it, is part of a community system of beliefs and a formal model, at least a formal Everything. statement of it, requires at least the use of a, of a symbol system such that uh, communication can ensue. Models. So that uh, in, right. in, okay. But so notice that, that this whole relation is actually a continuous process. It's never, you're never process. done. You're never a finished because, because time is always mm -hmm. flowing. And that means change is always flowing. So eventually um, the system of interest is going to change to a degree that if you don't, don't do anything about your model, even if it was very well encoded initially, it will no longer accurately represent the system. And, and my father even had a name for that. He called it temporal spanning. So that model will become temporally spanned and no longer work. Um, okay. So, in that in that context, you would say then that the formal model is a temporal model. I mean, it, no. it, to me, that, to me, that notion that you bring in here is uh, a question of the temporal. The question of temporality can be uh -huh. completely ignored in uh, in formal modeling by just saying I'm going to do a, a static model and it's going to be discrete. And so, therefore, the encoding aspect is discrete, oh. and the or, formalization activities are discrete, and the decoding is discrete. Yeah, that would work with simple systems um, or systems where the aspect of that system is something that uh, doesn't change, but you know, like a, a model of a car. Would that, say. Be, would that be a formal model in the context of which you wish to use the term? Jenny, may I do a suggestion? Sure. Uh, if we replace in, in the Rosen model, which uh, Judith put up a moment ago, yeah? Of those yeah I'm, boxes. Familiar. I, I'm familiar with I, you know. Okay, okay, okay. Let's replace the N with an S, the nature with society. No. no. Then, no. then this no. means that no. the inference is... No, that's not Rosen's... Uh, no, that's not the Rosen. Model. That's not We're thought. trying to go beyond it. Let's do a thought experiment. Okay. If you replace the N with an S, then we have a system which changes under the influence of its influences. Mm -hmm. So yes. then the arrows make change. There is no reproduction possible. Actually, we can say something about the expectation that we, our expectation that the system will be different at the next moment. No, I, I think the, you know, in this discourse, uh, what Rosen means by a formal model is something like, you know, what David Hilbert was talking about in terms of formal procedures, you know, in the 30s. 
basically you have tokens, you have states, you have symbolic states. The token yeah. can be manipulated according to rules that are understood by a community of observers, such yeah. that when when uh, anyone operates on the symbols, they get the same results and they can agree on the results. That's, That's one, kind of the, one type of model. But he also was into relational modeling, which for him was much more useful in biological systems than uh, material you know, uh, or mathematical. So, yeah. He was the first you, one to say there, there are the things you can models, have to, though, are yeah. the mathematical models that you're using to make predictions in this. In so this Peter's coding, point coding is that it is, Peter, if I correctly understand you, you're saying it is positivism. No, no. Well, in what <laughs> sense do you mean it's positivism? It's empiricism, certainly. It's empiricism. Um, Okay. and operationalism, um, but uh, people accuse things, people accuse, make accusations of, against positivism. I, I don't mean They're that. not necessarily against empiricism per se, or even operationalism. You know, our discourses are not limited by, by the, predict, you know, the modeling relation or what we can predict in, in our empirical models. Uh, there are questions that we want to ask that are not in that in that sphere, um, mm -hmm. but uh, in terms of the ways that science scientific models work, this modeling relation, which is a very specific set of ideas, it's related to Heinrich Hertz, uh, Heinrich Hertz's commutation diagram, and 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 it goes through this tradition of operationalism, you know, from Helmholtz, Mach, Hertz. Uh, and then to Bridgman and Bohr, um, that, um, that, that basically you have formal procedures that you make calculations and those are public. Those are agreed upon and the, and, and the symbols are constructed such that there's not any ambiguity about what's being done. You know, when you add, when you have the symbols two and a plus and a two, you, you, you always, um, you can always arrive at four. Um, uh, so, um, I, you know, we could talk about other kinds of modeling relations that might not be formal models, but this is the meaning of formal models in, in Rosen's context, as I understand it. I think it's, uh, it's if, if, we, if we could just have Jerry give his last question because we're running out of time. Okay. Okay. So, yes, I, I, I the notion of formal model in my understanding of it uh, is that it is a public model and that it uses logical symbols in such a way that the clarity and understanding of uh, the meaning is, is intrinsic to the symbols being used or the symbols are defined in such a way that the meaning of the formal model is clear. Uh, mm -hmm. and can be used by others in a logical fashion. And of course, the, the uh, paramount case of this is mathematics itself, yes. uh, yes. based on its formal models. So yes. that, that, so that, uh, so the, the role of dictionaries. Uh, is that the, yeah. the, point is that, the point is that the decoding, uh, the encoding and decoding relationships uh, must be related by a formal model and that that can be a discrete model or it can be a continuous model. And so that was the reason for asking that question it, from my perspective. Uh, the second part of the question or second question is, okay, so we have encoding and decoding. Uh, mm -hmm. There are a plethora of codes that have been okay. created by the human mind. I mean, really dozens of thousands of them. And yeah. the question is, uh, Robert uh, Rosen put at the essence of his modeling in, in page 60, the necess necessity for dictionaries, uh -huh. uh, dictionaries for the codes. Yes. And so the issue then become, is there only one dictionary for encoding? And that is, must be the mathematical dictionary? So no, that you end up with no. relations model yeah so what what he what he did in his work is he said by model i mean this uh, or by 
um, you know, he would define, so by complexity, I mean this, by simple, I mean this, and he would define it for what he's talking about so that as you are reading further, you use those definitions to understand yes. the mental model that he is trying to describe, okay? Yeah, what I, I find understand is that that the argument is. comes in when people use a different definition, say for complexity or for simple, or, I mean, I watch people go purple with, with anger over the statement that physics says it currently is, is too impoverished in entailment to explain very much in biological behavior. He said this in a talk, I believe it was in Linz, uh, Austria, but you know, the, the, he might as well have said some, that guy's uh, uh, wife was ugly or something. I mean, that guy took it so personally that he said, physics as it currently is, is too impoverished in entailment. And, you know, people then fit it into their own dictionary. Okay, and, is and, that, have you written is, that? Is that Judith, can I ask? Well, the, the question is with regard to formal models then. Is, do, uh, is there only one dictionary uh, that is available or do we have multiple dictionaries with multiple many symbol jagging, systems many and that these entailments that he <laughs> refers to can be encoded in one dictionary and decoded in another dictionary? Yeah, why not? Well, I mean, how? you know, diversity of perspective is useful because say someone who has a very different uh, worldview if they can accurately absorb the, the model he's describing and then turn around and put it in a different description that fits better for their own dictionaries without losing the meaning. You know, Rudy, you don't I have a question. Uh, can I ask please, you for the reference about that statement which you quoted from your father about please, physics? Uh, Is, did he ever write that? I think he said it all through life itself. You know, he oh, showed he how. He, there? Pardon? I, I don't know where he wrote that. Do, do well, you I'll, I can look for that and uh, email it to you privately. Afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a question. Uh, Jason has the floor. No, no, I have a question for, for Judy. Uh, did, did, did your father had uh, any relationship or uh, connection with the ASC group, American Society for Cybernetics? I uh, think so. Started? Yes, yeah. I think so. Uh, I, I think so, because um, he talked about cybernetics in life itself, but he, he, it was in the process of changing. Initially, it was about control strategies for... Uh, um, you know, rockets, rockets. Yeah, for for constructed systems and uh, information. Because I think that there was a split of perceptions uh, between I Triple S and uh, uh -huh. where your father used to be the president and uh -huh. ASC. I think, uh, philosophically or epistemologically, they had, uh, but but they are. There exists a larger dictionary, probably, where in close both perspectives. So right. And, and once I started going to the systems um, conferences, I started talking to uh, some of the cybernetics people and, and was told, you know, you should really participate with us, too, because it's, it, there's a lot of overlap. And I said... Um, so how would you describe it then? Because, you know, what my father understood cybernetics to be about back in the 60s and, and 70s, it seems to be have enlarged. Um, and now it's more of a science of context. It's a, a science of complexity. It's a science of, um, you know, as, as Lowell was saying, it's a science of studying um, organization itself. And so there is a lot of overlap than between the two, a lot of overlap. And I think Michael Lissack might be able to answer those questions about, uh, you know, dad's involvement with, with the cybernetic society in the past. Somebody should um, email him and ask him, but uh, he was 
paying attention back then and he he would be able to explain it. There was a British guy who was the president whose name, Randolph? Was it Randolph? Yes, Randolph Grenfell. Randolph yeah. Grenfell. Yeah. So he was one of the people that I talked to who said, you know, that I should. And I, so I would be interested, you know, I, it, it, I just wasn't sure how much uh, curiosity there was about dad's work or how much uh, of his work was, you know, being used. So, uh, when Lowell got in touch and, and suggested this, I was really happy about it. I'm well, using I, I, it all the time. Go hey. We are going over our hour quite a bit. Uh, you know, our purpose is really just to, to tantalize oh, one no. another with the ideas and, and have follow-up meetings. All right. Um, I still have a question in case um, I was away for a minute. Did your father ever talk about Popper's three world hypothesis? About what? There is a, a philosopher and his name is Karl Popper. And uh. there is a guy at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, William Dress, who in 99 wrote a paper on epistemology and Rosen's modeling relation. Uh. And, and in it, he used the work of this philosopher, Karl Popper. Okay. And I was just curious whether you knew anything about that. Um, and then we can always talk about it later. <laughs> no, I would have to look, I would have to look it up. I know that uh, my father was familiar with Popper's work, yeah. but it was, um, but it's interesting that someone uh, did a synthesis there, it sounds like. I, I'd be I think it's a good it paper. Good paper. Yeah, 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 the synthesis. I will and, yeah. and another question I have for uh, Judith is, did your father work uh, on, on metaphors? Did he kind of pay Oh my God, yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I'm so happy. Analogy, metaphor, and how they relate to models. And what's the difference? Yes. The similarity. All right. Okay. I think we, we need a, a separate Zoom session. A, yes, that would be a big session. one. <laughs> <laughs> that would be... Okay. I could, uh, so that if we can carry on with other separate Zoom, I'll be glad to organize anything for that, sure. and we sure. then go back to to Jason's platform. Okay, but uh, you know, it's only eleven uh, twenty. We have forty minutes, according to my clock. Yeah, uh, I'd like to return back, to, if I could, to my second question. Mm -hmm. This. Uh, issue is the relationship between the formal models and the discrete and continuous models uh, the, and the role of encoding. Uh, if if okay. one makes various meanings for decoding and encoding, how mm -hmm. does that to the formal model issues, which is, are very constrained? Well, there, that is the beauty of that diagram because those are not specified. And so some people, you know, may be better model builders than others. And what do they include in their model? And what kind of relations are they aware of and able to uh, find ways to represent in the model and so forth? that is the issue that that leads me to say we need to have a science of modeling i think uh because the errors you know if you could what develop would that, what would the science of modeling be like what was that what, what would, would what the science of modeling be like oh. well i mean the the multiple approaches to modeling uh complex systems in particular i mean modeling simple systems is much easier right because you can actually represent the whole system, whereas a complex system, by virtue of it being complex, requires an infinite uh, number of discrete models, as my father kept saying. And so we- Does it require an infinite number of discrete models or does it require yeah. simply a part-whole relationship? Well, if you, if you wanted to model the whole system, it would require an infinite number, but in science, you really only need to figure out what aspects of the system you have to encode in your model to predict those behaviors of the system that you're hoping to understand. So you don't, as he spoke, you don't need to know the politics of the human being in order to, uh, you know, 
model its metabolism kind of thing. But I have never understood, Judith, is why this belief in infinity plays such a profound role in the concept of modeling, and particularly because of time. time. Yes. Pardon? Time and change. I don't need time to make a discrete model. Time is not a necessary or and certainly not sufficient component for any model. Well, when you're modeling a living organism, you have to you have to take it into account because he actually came right out and said there are no states oh, yeah. in nature. That is a human construct. It is a mental figment, uh, if you will. It doesn't so, exist in reality. And so the concept of trying to model then um, natural phenomena without using that approach is different, right? But earlier, earlier we had we had agreed that you could make discrete models that were static. Yeah, you have to keep changing them as the system changes so that they don't, like think about weather forecasts. I mean, they have to constantly- Thinking about genetics. Uh, we're just looking for one okay. example, just one example that you can have a very perplex system that is very rich in behavior, yet mm -hmm. can be made from a discrete model that does not involve infinity. And in this case, I, I think the chemical sciences do that for you. Could be, and there are, there, you know, he never said that we have to dispatch with uh, using reductionist approaches. He said, we need them both, but you have to know when to use them and why uh, it would be dangerous perhaps uh, to take that approach when it isn't appropriate. I mean, that kind of, um, of awareness of where you lose information by using that approach and it's information that you need. For example, he said, if you want to understand why an organism is alive and your method for studying that is to kill it and dissect it and run it through all kinds of technology, he said, as soon as you kill it, you've lost too much information to understand why it was alive. So, but if you don't this, know, sort of, this I is think, a Jay, that argument. most of your, most of the examples. In which, which you're putting together uh, a series of different, if you would, formal models. I'm only concerned, say, for example, the, the science of genetics. Uh, mm -hmm. Genetic symbols are stationary, they're constant. Uh, you can mutate genetic systems, but they still seem to reflect uh, living systems in some sense. Well, Which, what about epigenetics? Who's here? How I see? I, I'm my what about distinction between formal models and encoding and decoding. That, that's what all I'm trying to communicate about. Yeah, and and so when you're dealing with genetics, there's there's more going on than a static. Um, of course, a static model of the organism will will uh, you know be of applicable. Course, but and but so you need to do science for encoding and decoding. But you're repeating yeah. yourself all the time. If I could just yeah, hear time. Yeah, I'm not sure if you can hear me. I can yeah. hear you. Okay, wonderful. Um, and not to add more to our stockpile, I fear adding more complexity to this conversation, um, but as perhaps someone is more familiar with the work of William Wimsett, uh, the book Reengineering Philosophy for Limited Beings has a pretty holistic and remarkable treatment of this idea uh, of human interpretation of our models and the philosophical differences and how we can reconcile the foundations of constructivism and formalism and positivism. Uh, in understanding how we can intuitively adapt our models um, to what's in front of us. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I think um, if we aren't familiar with the work of Bill, uh, William Wimsett, Bill Wimsett, uh, the book Reengineering Philosophy for Limited Beings has a <coughs> remarkable and holistic treatment of, of exactly this debate. Okay, good to know. Thank you, you want to put that in the chat box? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. There we go. If I understand Jay correctly, he makes a plea for discrete models. Is that the case? Yes, that sounds like what I understand too. Oh, I, I really am not uh, just, uh, uh, the question is, we have formal models. They can be discrete or they can be continuous. 
and yeah. that the mathematics of these two forms of of formal models are radically different. Mm, we all agree, I think. Okay, and so which one you choose and how you choose to use it in a scientific context is up to the author. Right. Yeah. Exactly. We all agree. That's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> no, 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 I'm sorry. You know, my, I spent years working on um, the model. I, 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 I consider myself to be a theoretical biologist and decades ago when I was a graduate student, I worked on the theoretical biology of Patti, Howard Patti and Robert Rosen. Uh, and um, the, the idea, that, the notion is that if, if you have these things embedded in percept action cycles, the encoding part are the measurements that would be done by in a formal scientific context. The decoding part are actions that are taken contingent on the predictions of the model. The model itself is the apparatus that maps between percepts and actions. Uh, and, and I can talk about this some sometime at a later date, but um, but basically, if you have these models that are embedded in uh, organisms uh, that are governing uh, action that's contingent on what the organism is sensing at any given time, um, then um, th that's the way to interpret it. Um, it, it. The modeling relation is different from a formal model in a community of observers. It's in, in, in the case where it's embedded in the organism, uh, it's not explicit in the same way. That's because Except, motion wants to explain life. Well, I think that the modeling relation is not necessarily uh, coextensive with life. Uh, I would say that um, he had a, a theory of um, MR related MR systems, metabolism repair systems, which was uh, very similar to and, and sort of a precursor of the autopoiesis idea. Um, so um, the internal models and the governance of behavior contingent on perception is not limited to life is what I want to say. You could have robots that have um, percept action coordination systems embedded in their functional organization, right? They, they're not, they're not self-regenerating. So they're not alive, yes. but they well, have all the They're an extension of us. Well, not necessarily. If they're autonomous okay. robots, they're not, I mean, they work, they work fabricated by us, yeah. but, but they're not, they're not continually regenerating their parts and relations. Right. So, so they're you not say alive that in that way. Yeah. So there are more models, you, you want to say that there are more models than the ones Rosen was using for explaining life? No, no, no. I, I'm just you're saying, saying that, that anticipatory systems are not model-based. Is that what you're saying, Peter? No, no, they are model-based. But what are you okay. saying then, besides that? They're not, they're not the same as, as the definition of life and the, and the functional organization that constitutes life, which has to do with regeneration of structure and organization. But that's an anticipatory okay. process. No, that's the that's anticipatory that's that's process, the anticipatory process is the governance of behavior by perception. And, well, and so what is driving uh, repair? No, it's a what, what, Peter is saying, what, what Peter is making a reference to, I think, is like something that's hotly debated today, that this whether it's possible to create moral uh, robots, like robots that are literally identical or replacing human beings. And, and if one believes that, then you get some extra mm. um, issues that, that need to be discussed. And when one does not believe that, then it's a moot point. So. Mm. Um, and I happen to not believe that. But there are people out there, not just Peter, who do believe that we will create moral robots. You mean like data from well, Star Trek? Yeah, like that. You cannot kill the robot. Like you cannot, you, you must let the robot 
keep on living or something. Yeah, I think there's a transition, uh, and I might be wrong here. That's being that may be being missed a little bit. There's a, uh, I think, a difference between a relational bio biology and an evolutionary biology. Um, I see, precisely. Uh, and uh, I again re reference the work of William Wimsett, um, who uh, I think, not ironically, was chair of the evolutionary biology department at the University of Chicago, um, uh, which I think is what uh, absolved the uh, relational biology. Uh, work that Rosen was doing at U Chicago. Um, I don't mean it replaced it. I just mean that it's worth uh, having a consideration that there is a different kind of premise that moves us forward from a science of relations to a science of continuous and active uh, development. Because the relations of the networks. Why don't you why is that the detention mechanism? And, uh, <coughs> Alex, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, how much have you studied the work of Karl Popper? Because I would say that he has the seeds of doing the two together. I'm not saying he's the expert or he did the best job, but that he has the seeds to, to look together at relations and and evolution. Have you I don't then, think so. I, I'm uh, young, I so. uh, jaded by the complexity of the field I'm entering. <laughs> um, <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I, uh, I've been tangential to most of this work, uh, but right now most of the pursuits I'm doing are in the Buddhist priesthood. Um, so that's wow. where my focus, my focus is uh, right now. Um, and uh, I do consider myself a young cyberneticist, but um, there's just so much complexity that I'm falling into. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm 24, so I have a lot of time to catch up on in this field. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm been tangential to most of this, and I'm still trying to get my bearings about me, but I think getting my steering system in order is my first priority right now, which uh, uh, in terms of my own path seems to be more mental priority. Well, Jamie, uh, thank Jamie yeah. if I may. Yeah, but may for, I first, Karl Popper, it, for Karl Popper, if the relational model is a historicist one, no, and it's just uh, to be rejected. Okay. Uh, if I may, uh, I will respond, but first, thank you, Alex, um, for your contribution, because it has been very important. Uh, what you said thank about you. William Wimsatt, uh, I, I mm. think that was a super important contribution. Now, uh, loot regarding... Uh, Popper, I think we need a separate Zoom session or a separate Club of Remy. There's a whole book the, of oh, Popper, The Poverty of Historicism. Where he uh, attacks historicism. And biology is historicism. Uh, no, uh, and Popper was active in the Theoretical Biology Club in England, so he has a whole set of writings on evolution that he labeled active Darwinism yeah. and uh, that has not been taken very serious by, or not by everyone, let's say this way. It's definitely not in the mainstream. So, so it's something that uh, there, there is a lot more to it than, um, than just saying yeah. it's uh, the poverty of historicism. Ooh. And now the interactions, of course, as the title of several of his books, and interactions is another word for relations, the way I understand it. But let's go back to anticipatory systems. Yes. <laughs> One thing that is interesting is what does it do to uh, the science of evolution if you consider this model-based aspect of life. So when you have an ecosystem full of organisms that are all interacting, they're not just interacting physically with each other. They are sometimes interacting with each other's behaviors or with each other's um, effects in the ecosystem. And some of those behaviors and effects, or you could say maybe all of those behaviors are, are at least influenced by this model-based quality of life. So should I try to answer? Uh, well, so, so I would say I would say they are interacting in terms of the entailments. That's the rich part. Right, exactly. So the model entailments are somehow spilling out and influencing whether some other species in that ecosystem survives or not. Yes, precisely. Right? So you get you get redundancies which yeah. create space. 
And so the, the concern I had with, with rapid global climate change is that at a certain point, if, if an environment changes too fast for most of the species to be able to adapt, because most of these models are, are somatic. You have all these organisms that don't have intelligence, that don't have, you know, trees, plants, yeah. etc., cetera, algae, uh, fungi, and can't change their models to match their environment any, you know, except over evolutionary time. They will die. You start to have die-offs, right? Yeah, and each die species off. that dies off it, uh, accelerates the rate of change for all the remaining species. And at a certain point, there will be no species that's, that's, you know, this is the kind of thing that needs to be modeled. I mean, is there a point where nothing is able to adapt? You know, even humanity with all of our technologies that we can use to change our the temperatures and the humidities and so on and create vaccines. We have models, we have models so we can adapt. Mental models that we can change in real time. Yeah. But, but what if, you know, uh, some kind of gut microbe that we need is no longer it goes extinct you know this kind of thing something that we don't realize we need that then is we a have very to repair it. then we have to repair yeah. it and then we'd have to figure out how to compensate because we can build all these workarounds but uh we can we can perhaps make a functional equivalent yes yeah, sometimes sometimes but at, at a certain point you know there's going to be very very um dangerous rapid change with a lot of cascades of extinction in different ecosystems and this is the kind of thing that really leads me to talk about anticipatory systems theory more because the model-based nature of life helps us persist but it also puts us in danger of rapid change and i think uh, it's that's always not, five for twelve it's always five minutes before twelve <laughs> <laughs> we can't prevent that. Um, well, that, that's that's a life based on fear. Mm. <laughs> so if I, I could be asking uh, Judith, your your talk about the negative uh, liabilities of a model based anticipatory system. What are the uh, lethal variables that we pull or can pull. You want to talk about that? Because I'm fascinated by your your father's work uh, thinking about democracy. Uh huh. So, in what in what sense to apply? You mean um, democracy? What, we watch, what, what would you and he say about what do we need to be looking at in terms of positive feedback loops cascading in your language? Uh, what are the liabilities or, or error issues we need to regard or disregard? Well, Where did uh, Rosen write about democracy? He did with um, the, the, the Hutchins Institute, all of those papers, and I can send some to you, Lowell, and whoever else is interested. But I mean, for example, he, he wrote a paper about planning that you know, just gives me goosebumps because it's exactly appropriate for the craziness in our country right now. Um, but one of the things he talked about was needing a, a common dictionary. That's kind of crucial because otherwise he said, you may agree on what the problem is, but you don't agree on um, how to solve it or what, you know, therapies to, to uh develop and so forth and so it's it's you know becomes he said when when the disease and the cure are indistinguishable what what benefit is there to that you if you don't have a way to avoid this infinite regress that we currently have when we're talking about what's wrong with the world and how to fix it um a lot of that he felt comes from using different dictionaries to define basic terms. So he said the first thing, first order of business would be to, for the purposes of a discussion, to agree to be using this particular definition here and you lay them out and then you don't uh, default to your own 
uh, private, say, definition of, of various aspects of life so that you can, you can all then kind of trans, create a translation protocol for this problem and this discussion. Mm-hmm. And then that makes good sense to me. And I think that certainly the Senate could use that. Paper. <laughs> yes. So, you know, <clears throat> so it will start- never be, there will never be a dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> It'll default, you know, default into all kinds of obscenities, right? Um, In infinity. <laughs> yeah. Lute, Infinite Lute, clarity. Why do you make such a claim, Lute? No, I'm so just asking, uh, hmm. responding that if, if we all have to wait for a dictionary, yeah, well, that's, people who actually that's want a utopian team. No, but <clears throat> look, the que- you you've made the assertion that the uh, there will never be a dictionary or or something sort of. What yeah. is the problem in establishing dictionaries? No, well, there will be uh, will be millions of dictionaries. Yeah, and that's uh, that's we'll the never agree about what's dictionary. The what's what's the problem with that? No. There's no problem with that. That's the state of the art. So formal models are not possible within the millions of dictionaries? Oh no, of course they are. But there's I'm no lost. reason to assume that there's a single there's a single dictionary emerging or that it should first be solved as a single dis- dictionary. Why should there? We we know it's ha- Habermas, for example, has this notion of that we all communicate with each other. We will not communicate with each other. These are assumptions that there is a com- common dictionary possible. Why would there be a common dictionary? If I may, it, it directly relates to, to yeah. I, I think what Judith is talking yeah. about is how we relate to time. Because in order to develop a dictionary, that takes time. And, and, and if we only want one dictionary, that means we need to stop the clock so we can sort out all our disagreements. But that never is going to happen. Napoleon so wanted that. Napoleon wanted that. Napoleon. Yeah, and we know uh, what happened to Napoleon. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there were other people who may have also wanted to believe like that. but. The, the question we need to ask is this a waste of time? I mean, are we helping people by saying go ahead and create a dictionary for everyone? Or or do we need to think more carefully about our relation with time? And I think that is the core of uh, Rosen's uh, work. And so if I may, about Napoleon. Napoleon uh, had the dream that he would solve the European problem of having different nations by making it all one empire. And then yeah. we had one dictionary, and that was French. Yeah, but even the Germans didn't that like that. Made of language yes. that we have the same dictionary. I have, I can tell you for sure, <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. because all the people who supported Bernie Sanders, like me, um, mm-hmm. were speaking a different language. You know, when somebody says socialism, and they're all yeah. American, you know, come yeah. on. Yeah. Uh, so it, what my father was suggesting was for the purposes of solving a particular problem in society, the first thing to do for that discussion and for that effort is to agree on a common set of, of definitions just for that effort so that, you know, you, you don't lose your individuality, but you then are not speaking at, you know, cross purposes to each other. If I could push Judith and the group here. Uh, Judith, you brought up the fact that this would really be good for the Senate. At one time, there was the Office of Technology Assessment as an arm of the Congress to help prepare Congress to understand all these technological changes from the 70s onward. Do we, what what would it look like if we had a systems, Office of Systems Assessment that, that, would would be assist, uh, that would assist, uh, you know, a decision making yeah. and ideas like what your dad said. Well, if we're going to solve urban renewal, this is the dictionary we need to agree on first. We have and such an institution. Our little in group the would do that. We have such an institution in the Netherlands. Oh, really? The systems assessment. Yes, 
It's a government oh. agency. And what they do in practice is they uh, are responsive to uh, questions from the parliament. Huh. So how do you get to be on that uh, government body? I mean, what kind of education is, is I would, I'd so be they so organize then technological knowledge and they make a right to report in response to government agencies. It's not, it's often mediocre, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't really understand what systems thinking is no 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 i'm not say, wanting to say anything negative uh, i i mean to say it, it's at the level of that parliament can absorb it <laughs> Lord, parliament, we should not... send an american aoc to to your to your office to learn that <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, what is missing is training in systems. I mean, I love the fact that Alex is here as a younger person when we're all gray hairs. Uh, yeah. That someone is actually interested in trying to take these this, these ideas and move it to practicality. Well, yeah. That's where uh, that's what they want to this, do. this group needs to be looking at. Mm -hmm. And I just want to just emphasize what Lute was saying the influence on the American democracy was the Scottish Enlightenment. And its birthplace really came out of the Netherlands and its ideas of perspective in painting. And I'm so glad that they're at least trying to have some reports, even though they'd be mediocre. But what's missing is a Horizons College to train people to think about systems. I'm dealing with some military people who just deal with their toys for the boys. Oh yeah, it's interesting. And, and, and you know, th this is the legacy of cybernetics. Is I have a drone in the sky that I can take out a terrorist, and yeah. then five more pop up as it's whack the mole. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. It's, it doesn't solve a problem. <laughs> well, Rachel, my daughter, uh, who has come to, to some of the IS conferences with me, um, she has been giving systems. Uh, you know, uh, systems courses basically for uh, protesters. Like she's involved with, you know, uh, Democratic Socialists of America here in Rochester and various other, uh, you know, um, Black Lives Matter and all of these kinds of groups and teaching them about systems approaches because she feels like they need to network and organize better and you know, the idea of organizing has to be a much more systems-based approach than this reductionist, uh, because every time, every time people who've been trained in reductionist science try to get scientific about education or, or agriculture or medicine, they, they end up creating factories again. And it goes right back to the, the machine metaphor of Descartes. So, you know, that's really not appropriate for life to begin with. It's in, in principle not appropriate. So, so to try and uh, turn our schools into factories and to standardize our children's minds, it, it's the wrong way to go about things. So when she gives these talks, and she gets like 100 people showing up for these things, and she uses some of the same slides that I showed you, and... Um, she says that they finally start to get it. They finally, and they come up and they're pretty excited about it. I don't know, uh, she's only didn't, done, I think, two of them. I helped her with the first one, and then she's done two by herself. And uh, she says that it, it, it makes sense to them. She's able to get it to make sense to, to people who are, you know, trying to uh, organize as citizens to, to push beneficial change in our government and our elections and so on. Judy, we need to invite your daughter to our club. Yes. I asked her if she could come yes. today, but she had a meeting uh, for work. So if you have it on a weekend, she could do it, or in an evening <laughs> here in, she lives in Rochester. So, it's but she. Thing, um, that I learned more about cybernetics and system science as a young swordsman and Buddhist than I did in, uh, I think, a, a formal education setting. Uh, and my research has been formal and practice has been formal, um, but in my own experience as a, as a young director of education in the San Francisco Bay Area, um, uh, formally, not currently, uh, the kind of um, models and expertise that I brought to the table was practical because it was embodied. 
uh, and practical because it was uh, um, a rigorous but felt sense of the kind of educational systems that I was uh, directing. Uh, and I think this is something that I missed in my own uh, cybernetics and system science education that I don't think really um, uh, is flourishing currently. I think that uh, from uh, what I see in the last six, seven uh, years, I've been part of this uh, broad cybernetics IEEE ASC community, um, is that we suffer a lot from the complexity of our methods and complexity of our backgrounds. Um, and I have yet to see a practical um, uh, movement that uh, roots uh, the kind of unified visions that we're talking about. Um, and I think that's simply because uh, uh, we don't have a good sense of what an embodied cybernetics looks like. I think we might have good models and a good strong sense of um, what the discussion and the uh, intellectual theorizing looks like. And this is all good until um, we want a movement. Uh, and there's a lot of anxiety. Sure. This is true. And you know, uh, just to, to make a comment here, um, the progress has been that there is no longer any argument. I mean, when my father was alive, he was getting argument and real anger uh, from, from people that wanted to hold on to the reductionist training and not recognize that there were aspects of the world, including ourselves, that it was not really appropriate to only use those. And now there is no argument anymore from anybody, even, you know, in my in boomer age group, um, there's a lot, my father was of course a generation older than me, but it's no longer a question that we need the, you know, the alternate approach to reductionism. It, the trouble now is though, they're still teaching the scientific method based on Descartes' idea that you could always take a complicated problem apart and study it in manageable chunks and so forth. And that creates a kind of a blindness in worldview and approach that then has to be overcome later. And, and we don't need to do that. So I think you're the kind of person that can actually drive that change because you see where it needs to be applied. And that is something new. So, oh, yeah. Alex, Alex, can you give yeah. your email address with the group, maybe? Mm -hmm. Who, mine? No, uh, or, uh, Alex. Uh, I can, I can, I can send you into, into the group chat. Also, um, yeah. uh, Jason has it recorded for, uh, for future emails. I think, in particular, my, my frustration um, is that there... That I have a lot of frustrations. <laughs> um, there, there, there seems just to be a general uh, lack of practical method. I think part of my frustration is that I'm coming into cybernetics as a field when uh, I, my, my intuition is that the majority of you have come into cybernetics from your fields. Um, and I For think, me. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I think I, I'm, uh, I'm uh, kind of wading in water up to my neck in a lot of uh, educational theories, ideas, cybernetic principles, and system science principles conferences uh, and conversations. Um, and what offers me the simplest, most clearest route forward is kind of, um, you know, jumping in the river and, you know, calling out what's happening from down the river. Uh, and um, uh, I think right now the, uh, the Buddhist path uh, offers me my own kind of clarity uh, and from what background I do have in cybernetics and system science is kind of being slowly rectified through that practice. Uh, well, he was, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, Buddha was able to recognize the anticipatory nature of mind and body 2,700 years ago. And that struck me at my very first course where he was saying that as soon as a percept comes into the, the brain, there is some part of the brain, the mind, that evaluates whether it's good or bad. That, uh, that I'm very and, doubtful about uh, what you're saying, uh, Alex, particularly. But why would there need to be embodied cybernetics? Why would we need a movement? I'm not so sure about those things. So, 
Okay, so your, your question kind of confuses me a little bit. Um, you, you talk about the works of Nicholas Luhmann, uh, who uh, applied the uh, Varela Mazzarana notion of autopoiesis to social systems, which uh, in my understanding was inherently a second order principle and required a sense of observership, which is itself an embodied notion. Um, so my, my, my cu I'm curious um, why you ask- Precisely the part which I wouldn't accept. Uh, tell me why. Because I think it is not observing which is important, but specification of expectations. Uh, observations only serve to control expectations, in, like in the chi square. Mm -hmm. so what's an, expectation? You have... an expectation is based on model predictions. Yeah, so on a discourse. It's not, it's not that we infer from observations. Observations are there to control statements. So uh, an old professor um, who is very familiar with the cybernetics fields told me a, a, a joke once, and he says, um, a, a, a scientist, a philosopher, and a cyberneticist walk up to a river. The scientist pulls out a test tube and a wind vane, takes out a dropper, puts some drops of water on a slide, looks at the mic microscope, turns around and says, it's conclusive, the river goes this way. The philosopher looks at him and says, what river? And the cyberneticist, meanwhile, strips naked, jumps in the river, and from down the river says, it's going this way, guys. Um, and uh, this is kind of the, the it's a, a poor and simplistic analogy, um, but this is the, the kind of idea I have in embodied science of cybernetics. Um, the, the difference, uh, as I'm feeling in my, in my own practice, in my own research, um, is this idea that observership and narrative um, and specifically, my work has been in terms of social and cultural resiliency, uh, that narrative and the kind of reflexive narrative of a, of a scientist is itself a method. Um, and that resiliency requires, um, I used to think it was something similar to the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition, this kind of uh, continuous adaptability of a system, but it turns out Dreyfus is rather a poor model. Uh, so I'm still with this, but uh, to answer your question, Adaptability is maladaptive. That's one of the things my father discovered. Say it again. Too much adaptability is maladaptive. So the whole okay. point of being an anticipatory system and encoding your environment into yourself is that uh, you don't just change based on what you know. You're not just reacting. You're in exactly. So, and this is the um, the work I'm currently I'm currently doing is that there are actually quite phenomenal models that exist already of non-reactive uh, resilience uh, and uh, there's this uh, like um, evolution that happens in the definition of resilience when you accept that you're not bouncing back or bouncing to but there's this constant uh, adaptation heuristical adaptation of a system that is almost anticipatory in nature but it has to do with how you define and uh, the relations between the objects of a system, much the same way system science and cybernetics does. But to do that, it has to be reflexive and um, subjective. There's no objectivity in the observership of how you define a, a, a relational system. And this is why I think an embodied cybernetics um, is critical because to understand the actual like intuitive navigation of what information to look for and what parts of the system to guide yourself through, um, you need to be a, as a part of the system. And again, this is a reflexive narrative kind of methodology. Yep. So I, I, in the beginning of this discussion, I made the point that the great achievement of Niklas Luhmann, one of his great achievements is that he said, it's interesting to look at communication Communication is not alive, but let's ask the question whether we can use Maturana's models to model communication, which yeah. is not alive and therefore not necessarily embodied. The communication itself might not be embodied, but making heuristics about a system which you are an, obs uh, an observer to uh, is in essentially an embodied kind of science. That's a communicating yeah. system, not a communication. But it involves living organisms all every which way. I mean, sure, sure, but they are loosely coupled, or perhaps they are. But it's whole reason coupled. Uh, so, yeah. I, I think, Lord, what is needed is that you define what you mean by communication. So if I think of communication as a book, then I say, yes, the book is not alive, but communication can be. Uh, we understood is uh, talking to each other. Is that a communication? 
And so we oh, have three forms of intercommunication. Uh, and let yeah. me now explain Newman, yeah, as far as yes. I understand it. Yes. Interaction, that's what we are doing now. Then we mm -hmm. have organization of communication, that's like in the book. And we have self-organization of the communication. Talking to yourself and your mental models. No, not, no, there's no longer talking about people. Then we are no longer talking about people. Then the self-organization of communication is steered by the codes of the communication. Mm -hmm. I, I want, I, I'm, I'm curious where, where these, these um, are coming from. I think I'm missing you because I'm not understanding um, you, you, the, the framework you're, you're moving from. Is it essentially constructivist, uh, foundationalist? Um, because if we're saying that... Deeply, deeply influenced by Luhmann. Well, why, why did it not make a difference? Because if, this, if the communication itself is a, is a constructed um, uh, architecture, right, then uh, it is accessed um, and looked at, it's referenced, uh, and that we're a part of that has to, you know, be a part of the method in which we're using to look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's another approach to this question, Lud. And, and that is the difference, and this is the profound logical distinction between modeling as modeling of a system and the uh, logic associated with communication between two or more systems. These are interdependent communications versus an independent model. So the interdependency among the parts of the whole is what is, uh, messes up the discussions. Sure, and sure. Then, I, I and don't. Then, I don't know that. At least formally, logic is in a place to address that conundrum yet. Um, I don't know that log lo logical methods or formal methods are in a um, uh, a place to articulate that in a way which is actually rigorous. Well, you you might take a look at uh, some of my work. Mm -hmm. So the repetition and the recursions and the incursions which occur in those interactions self-generate, and there Rashevsky is in indeed important, because then you have this option of a reaction diffusion dynamics. Yeah, self-generate new degrees of freedom, which yes. make the entailments which Judith is talking about. Yes, and this this impredictivity that intrinsic to interdependent interactions among electrical systems is absolutely crucial to your line of argument. Yeah, but that's a metaphor because oh, I'm talking about interhuman it's communication. It's pragmatism. Yeah, exactly. I, I agree with Jerry here. What's important, because we're coming to our, our end right now, uh, is that I think that what Judith and her father represents is not just looking at the model, but the model of the model, and there is a science there. A theory, um, not a science. Well, I think there's a rigor to be able to look at the consequence in the environment of that model. Right. And we right. being model creators can look at a consequence through time. Because what's interesting in our discussion before was there is no such thing, and this was done by Valerie Lamont when she's talking about Heinz von Forster. She, uh, Heinz von Forster said there's no such thing as a self-organizing system because self-organizing systems always organize within a context, context that has models. And there's a science there. My friends, I do have to uh, sign off at the moment. Um, it would be uh, interesting to continue about some of the work I'm doing in narrative resilience. I think there's a lot of uh, uh, poking to be done at it, uh, and I am interested in a lot of the things that are being discussed. So for maybe a future Zoom presentation, uh, I'll drop my email here in the chat box, but thank you for having me. Maybe. Uh, That's great. Yeah. I just want to bring up the fact that we're going to have a meeting next week. Uh, one of our people that's online now, Richard Knowles, will be presenting uh, what Rosen talked about in terms of identity, information process and relationship as ontological fundamentals is a basis of what Richard talks about. And so coming from a safety practical world, he has worked with DuPont to literally change systems, which is a message that this all this club of Remy has been about is, how do you change that system instead of components within a system? So, thank you, Judith.
Yeah. Email address, please. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I commented. Good job, Jason. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much.